we're going to walk through the browser and you're going to do exercises. And probably after lunch we're going to talk about part of ensemble which is called Biomark. And if we have time, we're also going to talk about comparative genomics and variation data in ensemble. So first I'm going to start with the introduction to ensemble. What you're going to learn today is Ensemble is a genome browser, so we're going to talk about what genome browsers are, what kind of data we store in Ensemble, and basically during the walkthrough I will show you how to find your gene of interest, how to choose correct transcripts, where are variations, where are uh, comparative genomics data such as homology and whole genome alignments. And also I will show you what Biomark can do and how to use Biomark to export data. Anyone uses Biomart? One person. <laughs> okay, so it's all going to be you. Please do ask me questions anytime you can interrupt me. So, what is Ensemble? You know that during the last years, loads of organisms have been sequenced, and all you get is basically this whole sequence, which doesn't tell you very much. Imagine all we would have for human is just this kind of sequence of nucleotides. It's not informative. What we need to do is to provide something we call annotation. What annotation does is basically it tells you where in the sequence the genes are, what maybe some functional regions of the sequence are, whether the region is conserved. This is what we call annotation. And this is what you can find in Ensemble. So it starts from the sequence and it tells you where genes are, variations are, conserved regions are. So that is what you can find in genome browsers. They provide a map telling you what can be found where in the sequence. What is special about Ensemble? is that it's a European project, it's an open source project, all the data are free. It started in 1999 when there was a lot of competitions. There were a lot of companies who tried to do this for profit. They tried to patent cheats. So this project was a European response to the initiative, tried to provide everything for free. So started with the kind of finishing of the human genome sequence. So provides automated but accurate gene annotation. It's open source. It also provides integration of these data with other sources. And it has both web and programmatic interface. Today we're going to talk about the web side of the things. If you have any questions about the programmatic interface, Please do ask me. Today we're going to mostly cover what type of data we have and how they're visualized using the website. Also, I have to mention so, uh, Ensemble is a joint project between the Sanger Institute. You know, it's a famous institute in the UK. It was involved in sequencing the humans, it's involved in sequencing mouse traits. They're a big institute. So it's a joint project between the Sanger Institute and the European Bioinformatics Institute. Ensemble is not the only genome browser. Probably many of you also heard about the UCSC genome browser. So it's very similar. NCBI, uh, a site you probably know, has their own genome browser as well. It's called Mapure, and here we have UCSC genome browser. So Ensemble is similar. If you use any of these, the data I will be showing you will be familiar to you. So similar to these two. What kind of data we have in Ensemble? So we divide the data into a few categories. The main ones are core data. So we con Ensemble contains uh, the genomic sequence. It has gene transcripts and protein models. It contains a lot of external references, references to other databases. It also shows you where cDNAs, protein, microarray probes are, backclones, repeats, and other things. 
So that's in the core part. We also have comparative data. We can tell you what orthologs or paralogs are known for given genes, protein families. We can, uh, we can visualize whole genome alignments or syntonic regions in case you work with comparative genomics data. Also include a lot of variation data, such as sequence variants, structural variants, regions that we can show you whether that region in genome is in linkage with equilibrium and similar types of data. The newest kind of data are regulatory data. These are based on ENCODE project. And they provide a single best guess of the location of functional elements. And as I said, the links to other databases are important. In addition to direct links we have, we also are part of something called Distributed Annotated System, or DAS. So a lot of the data can be added into the database using this resource. You will just see sometimes in Ensemble that next to some information it will say DAS. It just means that it comes from other databases. Now, Ensemble is provided by many people, so if more than 50 people are trying to provide this resource, so this is just the list, it's headed by Paul Fliczek, which is who is responsible for the EBI part, and Steve Searle, who is responsible for the Sanger Institute side. We have quite a few people, including me, in the outreach group. We are responsible for teaching, training, but also helping people. I will show you that we have something which is called the help desk, where you can email with any questions or problems you have. Now, what kind of species we have in Ensemble? Ensemble started at, with the human sequence, and it focuses on vertebrates. So only, we have more than 50 species available, but majority of them are vertebrates. We only include three out species, which is C. elegans, Prosophila, and Prosophila is somewhere here, but um, and Saccharomyces. So three non-vertebrates for comparative genomics purposes. All the other organisms we have are uh, vertebrates. How many of you do work with the human sequence? Couple of you. Anyone works with mouse? Anyone works with other species? Which species do you work with? Oh, rice. Rice. Okay, I will show you where to find rice. So we have a few, few people who may find this resource interesting. So if you work with plants, bacteria, fungi, or prophets, you may want to look at a site which is similar to Ensemble. It's called Ensemble Genomes. All you will learn today can apply to the site. It works the same way, but Ensemble Genomes includes these other uh, organisms. As I said, includes plants, fungi, metazoa, protists, bacteria. The site is very similar to Ensemble. It's just stored in a different place. So you may want to have a look at this. So now, what we start with are gene models. So how do people know where genes are located in the genome? They can, uh, the annotation can either be uh, automatic or manual. Does anyone know automatic and manual? Does anyone know manual curation? Are we familiar with manual? Okay, would you like to tell us what <laughs> manual curation means? What, what, what may be the difference between these two? Manual curation, which 
as your colleague said, is better than the automated one, it's reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis. So someone sits in front of a computer and goes through all the evidence we have and decides where the gene is. This is very good, very exact, but very slow. At the time when the human genome sequence was released, there was the need to produce, to annotate all the genes quickly. So in that case, the automatic annotation came into place. So Ensemble mainly includes automatic annotation, but for species like human and mouse and zebrafish, we also have manual curation. In addition to these sources, we also import gene models from some specialized databases such as Flybase, Wormbase, or Yeast database. We also create some gene models based on uh, expression sequence tags. We're going to talk about the differences later. Purely programmatic uh, gene predictions, up in the show predictions, can also be found. We have annotation for non coding RNA genes. And very recently, we also produced gene models based on RNA sequencing data. We know the next generation sequencing produces loads of transcriptome data. So nowadays, for human and zebrafish, we start to uh, create gene models based on this data as well. But for now, we're just going to focus on the two main sources of the gene annotation. assemblies come from. Ensemble does not produce genome assemblies. We do not sequence organisms. We import the sequence from the major consortium. So for mouse, the assembly called NCBI M37 comes from NCBI. Zebrafish has its own assembly. Human assembly comes from Genome Reference Consortium and the name of the assembly is GRCH37. Or in UCSC, you can see that it's called HG19. Special thing happening in human is something called patches. So the human sequence we have, that it constantly is being updated. And the updates are called patches. If you do not work with human, you can forget this. But in case you work with human, you may see something like TRCH37P3. So this just tells you that it's something to keep in mind. It's an update of a sequence, or you know that several regions have different sequences, different haplotypes in that region. So patches would also include uh, alternate assemblies. When assembly comes, a new one, we perform this uh, this automated annotation, even though it's automated annotation, it's based on experimental evidence. So if I go here, I said automatic. It is automatic, but it is still built on um, experimental evidence. So it's not purely decided by a computer. So what experimental evidence do we use to annotate the gene? First, we use sequences which are available in this International Nucleotide Sequence Database collaboration, which includes all the three major nucleotide databases, ENA, which is the EPI one, GenBank, and also the DNA database uh, of Japan. We also include protein data, which comes from a protein database. Uh, you will hear more about tomorrow. It's called Uniprot. Anyone heard of Uniprot? So it's a big protein database. It has two parts, Swissprot and Tremble. Swissprot is part of the database which is manually curated. So again, similar way, someone sits there and reviews the, the sequences on a case-by-case -case basis. So Uniprot has a very uh, reliable part, Swissprot and then less reliable part, Tremble, which is just a set of unreviewed proteins translated from the nucleotide database. We also include biological evidence coming from NCBR RefSeq database. And then again, it can be the manually annotated ones, which in RefSeq starts with the NP and M records, or just predicted proteins. 
this agenda we do not include it in our song. So, just to make this point really clear, automated annotation, but still based on biological evidence, very different from an initial prediction which purely uses computer algorithm. So most genes based on automatic annotation, in addition we have the manual curation. If you want to find out more about how many proteins were used, how many cDNAs were used, you can find information on a species-specific page where there will be a PDF document uh, telling you more details about the process. Uh, we have all the records, all the cDNA records and protein records, and what we do, we generally start with aligning species-specific proteins and cDNAs. This would be the part of something we call targeted build, and the genes will be annotated as known transcript. We, in addition to using species-specific proteins and cDNAs, that means for human, I use human cDNA or cDNA and protein found in human. I can also use these uh, to predict genes in other species. In this case, we talk about similarity build. And if we don't have enough information, imagine, for example, for a lizard. We don't have that many lizard-specific cDNA and protein. So in that case, we use something close. For lizard, it will be chicken cDNA and protein. So they would be built in this part called similarity build, and in here we align protein and cDNAs from closely related. And in this case, you may see that the transcript will have a word novel next to it. It doesn't mean that we discovered it. It's just novel because the cDNA and, and protein comes from a different species. So known transcript and novel transcript, you may see. After we align all these cDNAs and mRNAs, we just get rid of all the redundant transcripts and cluster all the findings into one isoform. So you know that one gene can have several transcripts or several isoforms. And this can be supported by different cDNAs and proteins. So we take all the evidence and just make one transcript out of it. So now how does it look like in ensemble? This is a typical view of the genome browser. Here the blue bar represent the assembly, the genome sequence. You can see that we also have the position here, chromosomal location and chromosomal band. And now, here is a, is a line which represents all the species-specific cDNAs. So we would align all these to the genome. We would also align all the proteins and then we would predict here the transcript. So this is how transcripts are represented in ensemble. All these transcripts are part of SMAP2G, but you can see that they represent slightly different, different transcripts. If you want to know more about a transcript, all you need to do is click in any position. Or if you want to know which, what this record represents, in ensemble, you can click on majority of things. So all you need to do is click in any positions. And a new window like here will open with more information. Now, also, as before we go further as well, I want to say, so transcripts are represented by these slides. These boxes on the line represent exons. If, if the lines are, un if the boxes are unfilled, Anyone would know what this actually means, the unfilled or filled. You can see that we have several exons here, but some at the start and sometimes at the end are unfilled. Would you know what's the difference between filled and unfilled exon? So, as I said, it's only at the start or end. It will never happen in the middle. So unfilled boxes would represent exons which are not protein coding. They would be representing untranslated regions. So this 
part of the transcript is part of a 5 prime UTR. This would then be the first coding exon. It's just so you know. So the line represents transcript, the boxes represent exon. Filled boxes are coding, unfilled represent untranslated part. Now, how do you know which transcript comes from where? So you could see already on the page before that they have different colors. So one of them is blue, which just means a process transcript, a transcript which does not code for anything. But this red and gold and the numbers can help you understand whether the transcript comes from manual curation or automated. So, if the transcript starts with two, it comes from ensemble. An ensemble is the automated annotation. If the name of the trans, if the number of the transcript starts with zero, it comes from something called Havana. And Havana is a group at the Sanger Institute which does manual curation. So where the Havana genes are manually annotated, they're only available for human mouse and zebrafish. Ensemble genes automatically annotated for all species and their genome wide. So here we can see APC202 is a transcript predicted by the ensemble pipeline, and here APC002 comes from Havana. If you forget this, you can still, as I said, sorry, you can still, as I said, click on the transcript, and actually here is one line which says analysis. So it will tell you whether it's ensemble or Havana. There's a special case when the transcripts are in both, and as it says here, it's uh, ensemble Havana merge. So in most cases, we're hoping that the automated annotation is as good as the manual one. And in this case, where the automated and manual agrees, these would be the golden, the very good transcript. So golden ones, both ensemble and Havana agrees on the transcript. Now here we only show you whether it's automated or manual, but maybe you want to know what cDNA or protein has been used uh, for prediction. So what is my transcript based on? We have a special view I will show you later, which is called transcript supporting evidence. And in this view, which looks maybe a little complicated, but at the top you will see the individual transcripts, and below a list of all the proteins or cDNAs which were used to, to create this gene model. For human and mouse, there's one more level of accuracy or review process. And that's called the Consensus CCDS project. I don't know if you've heard of it, but you know that still if you look at different genome browsers, or so you could see that there are a lot of cDNAs and proteins one could use to predict something. So for human and mouse, people want to have the same set of genes everywhere. They want to just be sure that they're using the correct transcripts. And that what comes from consensus uh, coding sequence project. It's available, as I said, for human and mouse, and the aim is to identify a core set of protein coding regions, consistently annotated and of very high quality. So if you want a really, really reliable transcript, you would look for something which is called CCDS, or in ensemble here is CCDS set, and uh, in this case these are labeled in green here. So that would be an additional information you can get out of ensemble. It's only for human and mouse. And the consensus coding project is a uh, collaboration between NCBI, UCSC, and ensemble to provide consistent annotation. Now where gene names come from? For human genes we have a consortium which decides on gene names and it's called the AGLC. 
The same is available for mouse and zebra fish. For other organisms, in most cases, we uh, try to get names in fact from Uniprot or Rexy, or they will be uh, added by uh, something you will see sometimes known by projection. It just means that the name comes from an orthologous relationship. So, for example, I use human gene to predict the uh, gene in chimpanzee. So, I will use the name of the gene in human, for example, BRCA2 in the chimpanzee. So, then the name would be known by projection, which is projecting it from another species. Now, you already maybe noticed that there are kind of strange looking numbers and identifiers. So, in addition to the gene names, which are not very stable, we also have identifiers which we hope are um, stable and unique. They do not change in time. Sometimes the gene names can change. So, Ensemble has this kind of identifier, so always, they always start with E and S as an ensemble. And then they would follow G for gene, T transcript, P protein, or E is for an exon. These would be human specific identifiers. For other species, a suffix is added. So for zebra fish, which is dami or rario, it would be E and S, D, A, R, and then G for G for G. Mouse would be M, U, S. It's just because you will see it on the side. It's important to understand what you're looking for. Or maybe someone gives you a list of some ensemble identifiers, so it's kind of handy to know what they represent. Now, how to assess the data? We will shortly start looking at this website. So this is the front page of the browser. You can see a search box at the top. You can either search here for a uh, through all species, or you can select the species you want and go to a species-specific database. On the right-hand side, we have some health tips and news. And here in this window, we have also links to uh, ensemble genomes, if you want to look at plants, fungi, bacteria, or all the other species. Ensemble here actually uh, is the, are the news from the latest release. Ensemble tries to update data very often. So almost every two months you get new data in Ensemble. So in case you read the publication which is older or someone gives you data which were produced using an older version, we also provide something which is called Ensemble Archive. So the link is just here somewhere at the bottom. So you can see that we store all the older versions in case you need to need to check how the page looked like before. And here are all the URLs how to get there. In addition to older version, we also have a site which is called Ensemble Pre, and there we have new species which are not undergone the automated gene annotation. So you can use these species if you really want to start your experiments before, you can use these assemblies here using BLAST mainly. So they would, have, they would not have the gene models, but you can still use them for BLAST searches or similarity searches. So that would be on some pre -site. Sometimes people think that Ensemble is too complicated compared to UCSC or other browsers. Ensemble is organized in different windows, which sometimes confuses people. So this window you, show, you saw just before with all the transcripts is generally found in something we call location. So Ensemble has several different tabs you can switch in between. So we have a specific page which shows you the uh, surrounding of the transcript or the position of the transcript and it's called location. You can also uh, look at gene-specific page, transcript-specific page, variation-specific page, or regulatory region-specific page. Don't worry as yet, 
switch and look for different information. Uh, this is how the pages look like. You can change them by selecting any options on the left hand side corner. So each of these windows will have a different options here. And you can also add much more information by using this configure this page button. So these are the displays you can change the part of the page you're looking at. You can also change it by using configure this page. You can use this button to export some of the data, but we'll be trying this later. Now, I may just be using the word track sometimes. So what do we mean by track? It's just the different information you're adding in this view. So if you're not familiar, so individual tracks would be, so here we have a track showing the transcript, and here at the bottom, it's a track showing all the variation in the region. So I would say variation track. You can zoom in and out in the location page. You can either drag a rectangular, or you can use the sliding button, or you can jump by typing in your gene name, or you can use the location coordinates. In addition to this uh, website we're going to be looking at, you can also assess the data using Biomark, I'm going to talk about later. <coughs> A lot of data are available from download from the FTP site, so maybe you want all the genes for human or all the proteins or all the variations. So much easier obviously than going into the website and going one by one. You can download bulk data from the FTP site. Or if you know Perl, you can export the data programmatically using a Perl API. You can also, if you really, really want to, you can create your ensemble, so even the web code is available to be used. This is just the parallel API. Again, as I, so, as I showed you, the data are divided into core, comparative genomics, variation, regulation. So, so does the parallel API, if anyone is planning to use. In addition to providing a genome browser, we will also have a look in ensemble you can directly use plus and plus searches. You can try. We will have a look at Biomass. And in addition to it, we also have additional tools which you may find useful if you work with sequences. So we have three tools at the moment. Assembly Converter. People who work with mouse or human find very useful because you can convert coordinates between different assemblies. ID history converter, that's just to uh, use with the ensemble IDs. If you work with variation data, we have something called variant effect predictor. Variant predict effector, which uh, is a tool which will help you to predict the effect of individual variants on the sequence. We are going to use it in the afternoon. So just additional layer of information or tools one can use in ensemble. Now, the site has been developed by ensemble, but has been implemented, as I showed you, the web code is also freely available. So, uh, similar databases using ensemble behind are also available. So, here are just a few of them. Vector base using ensemble, thousand genomes project, or for plants, the Grameen database. Exactly the same. Today, if you learn how to use Ensemble, you can use many, many more databases because they work on a similar principle. So this is just three representative ones, but there are many more. Now, if you forget everything I've been telling you, or you just don't really want to listen to me, then uh, the most important link, I think, is the help and documentation. So in documentation, you can see many articles describing, again, the gene annotation, how it's been done, how the RNA sequence gene models, for example, have been created, how no coding RNAs has been created, where variation data comes from, all sorts of things. Or if you're interested in the parallel API, it's with all the documentation here. So you can read it later on if you, if you start working with the data or you're interested. What if in the, under the help option at the top of the page, we also have uh, tutorials. We have video 
video tutorials hosted on YouTube which cover most of the things I'm going to be talking about today. So maybe you have students or colleagues who couldn't come today or you will not use Ensemble now but maybe you go back to it in a year. So we have very many tutorials here you feel free to, uh, to look at. We have a glossary and as I said uh, we have a help desk where you can email any questions or comments. Maybe you look at some team which you don't think is correct or you would like to see a species we don't have. So uh, under the help page there's a link contact our help desk. So feel free to email us any questions or comments you may have. And as I said, so if you don't want to listen to me, it's the video tutorials. You can also look at the newest data on our blog. You can follow us on Facebook or Twitter. So if you start using Ensemble, often you may want to uh, be sure that you're up to date with all the new data. So these are links. Generally, 
in green in ensemble here, it gives you kind of more information about what this view means. But I'm going to close it now so you can see more of the page. So this is just, you can see the eye here, this is just for your information. So I'm going to close it. And now we can see a view similar to the one we saw before. So this is the assembly, this is the cloning, and here we can see uh, BRCA2 transcript. So in this case, for uh, BRCA2 gene for mouse, we only have one transcript annotated. And do you know whether this one is uh, ensemble automated or manually curated? So if you don't remember whether it should start with 2 or 0, what you can do is click on the transcript and this new window pops up. And I can see that here at the bottom, analysis on some of transcript. If I want to find out more about the neighboring genes, again, all I need to do is just click on the transcript and again, another window will open up. If you want to close it, you just click on the X. So, in this view called Gene Summary, we can see the name of the gene, we can see whether any CCDS project has been associated with it, any transcript. So in this case, this gene has been annotated by the consortium. What type of the, um, the gene it is, and uh, how it's been annotated. At the top of the page, you can also see location, and in which strand the transcript. As I said, you can change this gene summary view by selecting any of these views on the left-hand side. So if you would like to know what is this um, transcript based on, you could select uh, this supporting evidence view. But we're not going to do that now. We're going to have a look at the sequence of BRCA2. So I'm going to select sequence. And you can see that the top stays the same, but the bottom of the page reloads. And this is a classical fast A format of a sequence with the header at the top. So it starts with chromosome. Then now you should know what this NCPI M37 stands for. Any guesses what this, this represents? NCPI M37. No, so that's the name of the mouse assembly we're using. What this five would mean? Can I help you see the top here? So five is the chromosome. This is the star, and and this one at the end. Anyone knows what the one stands for? So there can be either one or minus one, and one stands for the forward strand. If there was minus one, then the sequence would be drawn on the reverse strand. Exons in this view are, are highlighted in red, and these surrounding sequence, so intro, is then just in black. This may look a little bit boring, as I mentioned before. Uh, you can adjust every window by selecting options in configure this page. So if I click configure this page, for this window, I have an option to show variations and add line numbering. So I'm going to select yes and show links for variations and line numbering relative to this sequence. It's just an example. I'm trying, I'm trying to show you as much as you can do with the site, so don't worry. You'll find no special meaning of it. So once I'm happy with the selection, I save and close in the top right hand corner. And the page will reload, and this time I will have the sequence with the line numbering and location of the individual variants here. And the links, so again if I click on it, I get 
more information or I could follow the link on the right hand side. So why you may want to use this window, for example, let me want to sequence the exons, for example, in human a lot of people. So you can just copy the sequence and use it for blast or designing primers or something. So if that was the sequence view. Below sequence, we have something which is called external references. So it's one of the first links, if I click on this one, where you can directly move to other databases you will hear more about tomorrow, such as the Unipro database, or for mouse here you can move into other databases. So all the links are live, all you need to do is just click on them. Something Interesting, maybe there's also a link to a Wikipedia similar page which is called WikiGene. If, if you quickly want to know what the gene does or, or is involved in, you can follow these links. Or Uni, Uniprod also has good description of key functions. Then we have links to regulation. But what I'm going to show you now is one of the comparative genomics links, and that's linked to orthologs. So, a similar genes in other organisms. So, I click on Ortholog, the page reloads, and I can see a brief summary. So, maybe I just want to look at um, primates in this case. So, I'm going to select that I want to see these. You can select all if you want to. And then below, you can see the name of the species, what type of Ortholog it is and then links to that individual species page. So, in the ortholog view, you can see whether similar genes, homologous genes, have been found in other species. And it shows you that in tabular format, you can have a look at how well the individual, uh, that the mouse gene, and in this example, bush gene, alive, or you can just check that by target very similarity, so how similar the sequences are. For every gene, we also have variation specific links. So if you go further below ortholog, you can also select link to variation table we're going to have a look at now. So variation table gives you a summary of all the variations found in tabular format and in this case variants are divided based on their functional consequence. We're going to talk about it a little bit more in the afternoon. So you can see that in total there are 95 variants. If you for example want to see which are not synonymous so again you just follow the link and here you would see the details of the individual variants. So uh, the position, what alleles they are, where they come from, and if you wanted to move to that specific page, you would follow uh, the variation link here. So all these different types of data are available for a gene, an ensemble, as I said, in addition to location gene, we also have page which is specific for transcript. So now we covered all in gene. You can see that the gene here is in white. Now I'm going to move on to the transcript page. So you can either click here or I can follow the link from here. So now I'm in transcript. Again, I'm going to close the information. And you can see that the option is slightly different this time. So again, we have the supporting evidence what uh, cDNAs and protein have been used to design this transcript. And sequence this time, you can choose different options. So let's have a look at the view which says sequence exons. I'm going to open that. And here the sequence is represented in a slightly different way. Anyone can guess what this purple will mean this time. Again, it's only at the start and possibly at the end of the transcript. So in this view, the purple letters represent
represent untranslated region. In green, small letters is the upstream region. The intros are in blue here. Coding sequence in, is in black. You can see in this view the start and end position of individual exons, the length of the exons, and also start, <coughs> sorry, start and end phase of the exons. This is only important, for example, if you're designing mass knockouts. You sometimes need to know in which position within the last code of the intron starts. So that is a view called exons. We also have a view which is called cDNA. This view is important to some people, mostly looking at variations again. So in this view we have the um, mRNA sequence in the first line, the coding sequence in the second, and then the uh, aligned protein sequence below. Exons are alternating in blue and black. And the individual triplets of nucleotides which represent codons alternate in, alternate in yellow and white here. Again, you can, you can opt to see the variants or by going to configure this page you can turn them off. The next view in your booklet is the general identifiers view, which is the set, uh, similar to external references. So general identifiers would link this transcript to other databases such as UCSC, CCPS. Here you can also see how well the overlaps are between the RefSeq transcripts. You can opt to view the alignment, so it's for DNA, peptide, and again Unicron. The number of databases here depends. Different organisms obviously will have different, different uh, links to different uh, databases. We also map uh, location of majority of uh, microarray probes that measure gene expression, so it's just Illumina or Affymetrix, so if you're looking at something like that, you can quickly see what probes have been found to overlap with this transcript. For that, you would follow this oligoprobe links. We also try to bring data from the gene ontology database. Now, not everyone knows what gene ontology database is. Do you know? Cannot so. The links are here if you're interested in ontology tables, so they would cover the cell localization, uh, biological function, and molecular function. So they would be either you can opt for a chart or again a simple to understand table with all the direct links to uh, go and go slip in this case. Now I haven't mentioned anything about protein, so the last view we are going to look at on the transcript is this protein summary. So in this case we have the protein sequence at the top. The alternating pink and purple represent the individual exons. And functional domains annotated for the protein are then represented as those lines or boxes. They come from different different databases. If you want to know more, I haven't showed you that. So if you just hover over the term, you can select the I button. It will give you more information and you can, it will take you to the home side of the database. If you want to know more about the individual domains, again, you can just left click and uh, the links will be you can view the same thing using domains and features. In this case, you will see just the tabular format of the same data. You can opt again to display variations or turn them off. So this is all about at the 
moment for Jean and this time transcript. The last view we're going to look at is back the location view. So now I'm going to go back to the location. So at the top of the location view, we have the overview of the whole chromosome. So Raka2 gene is at the very end of the chromosome file. Here you can see the transcript neighboring Raka2. And at the bottom, you can see more detail. So as I said, Raka2 is on the forward strand. So you can see that in this view, it's kind of drawn above the sequence. These two the small nuclear RNAs are transcribed from the reverse strand. So you can see they're below the blue bar. And you can also see that the arrows point in the way of transcription. So in this case, these go that way. Rapid two goes that way. This view is, even though it doesn't look like at the moment, is the most powerful one. You can attach many more in information tracks. And that you again would do using this configure this page button. But in this case, we have many different things we can add. And in your booklet, we are going to select unipro proteins. You can pick any one you like. I'm going to select one of the protein alignments. So I'm going to select unicrop proteins are already there. Maybe I want the more specific ones as well, so I can select these. You can see that you can opt for different ways how these will be visualized. So they can either be split or they can be grouped. You can play with these things later. Again, if you want to know more about the data, then you can click on this side. I'm also going to attach conservation scores which will be available here under multiple alignments but you may not always need uh, you may not always know where to look for things like this so we have a, here a search button as well so if you don't know where uh, the individual information is you can just use that search button so if I start typing conservation scores You can see that it gives me an option of what I want to look at. So in our case, we want to look at conservation scores, maybe, and concentrate elements. So once I'm happy with the selection, I click Save and Close. Sometimes when 
too many people try to do the same thing. The browser doesn't handle that very well. So you can, here are options for adding alignments, receiving same data. Again, if you want to select or deselect species, you would go to configure this page. So you can try that. What I haven't mentioned as well, on most of the views you will see this little help button. If you're not sure what the view means, what color the things code for, yes, so a little bit slow. So if you get something like this, don't worry, just try again. But um, help buttons at the top here will um, give you a description of the individual page if you get lost or quickly once. So these are very useful. Now the last thing I wanted to show you is how to use Blast, Blast, it's very similar to the one in NCBI, but the visualization is slightly different. So in order to use uh, Blast and Blast, we will need some sequence. I'm going to go back into the region in detail, and I'm going to export the sequence. So I'm going to use export data. And I'm quite happy with exporting fast day sequence. You can change how big region you want to export. I'm going to click next. And for this purpose, I'm just going to view it as HTML. And I'm just going to copy a part of the sequence. Can copy the whole thing. And I'm going to use this in blast or blood. So at the top of the page, you can see that the main thing is the search window where I'm going to paste the sequence. And here are a few options. Ensemble, because I've searched the mouse genome, it already knows that I probably want to look at mouse, but you can select any species you like. It also recognizes that I'm inputting a DNA sequence, but if you have a peptide, you can select a peptide database. You can change the options then, uh, as you wish, similarly to NCBI. Ensemble by default, the same as UCSC uses blood, which is much faster and works well for um, very similar But if you want the traditional blast, then you would just select the blast. Then. But for the purposes now, we leave the blast and click run. side sometimes surprisingly is more um, is faster because the last blood even if they're using the um, USA nerve um, these databases are actually stored in uh, in the UK so probably it's quicker to use the normal side so doing exactly the same thing just using ensemble.org uh, I go to this page so you can see that in Ensemble, you can visualize the blast blood hits directly in the karyotype. So similar matches which are similar are represented by these red arrows. The first, the most closest match, then has a rectangular around it. This is something you generally... I didn't get a match, so I need to select here my 
sequence with a repeat, so you can see the short sequence which matches the genome in many places. So this is more similar to the NCBR view. And at the bottom here, we have a table of all the matches, the location, start and end, calculated E value. But what's really good about Ensemble is that if you follow this C button, the config view, you will be directly taken back to the browser. So you do not need to do twice uh, searches. You don't need to kind of look for the sequence later on. The last hit is represented in this case by this red line here, and it directly on something tells you where it's located. That was a very, very brief overview of what can be found in Ensemble. And now we have a few exercises to try. You don't need to do the access if you don't want to. If you maybe want to look at your own gene or search for some other data, then feel free to do that. But on page, actually on the next page, so on page 24 there are exercises and they're followed by answers, so you can always check whether you're doing the right thing. But please feel free to ask me as well. I will be here, so if you have any questions. So if you could start doing the exercises, and we will have a tea break at quarter past 11. So now you have plenty of time to... What? Yeah. So now you have plenty of time to go through the exercises, ask me questions, maybe look at the documentation, just feel free to to explore what you like. After the exercises, I will show you how to use Biomart. So, I'm going to talk now about Biomart. So, link to Biomart can be found on every ensemble <coughs> page. It's at the top, as I showed you, here's their book. Now, Biomark looks completely different to Ensemble, but the data are coming from Ensemble. So, Biomark is a tool which will allow you to export large amounts of data from Ensemble without any programmatic knowledge. So, if you're working with one gene, then you may say, oh, I don't need Biomark, because it's easy to go and find information about one gene. But imagine you want to export variations for 100 genes you found. That would be very hard if you're going into the Ensemble website. So Biomark would be very useful in this situation. So Biomark allows us to export large amounts of data. And we can either export them as tables, or it's also very good to export um, large number of sequences. So maybe you want to export all uh, microRNA genes in the genome. So then Biomark would be able to do that. So it takes all the data from Ensemble. It processes that in some way. And then you can ask it to export either tables or sequences. So it can be specific or general. You can either export all genes or proteins for one species, which probably is not so good to do in Biomark. We generally put all these kinds of data on the FTP side, as I already said. It's probably easier just to download them. But maybe you just want protein-coding ones or non-coding ones. So Biomark would do that. Or you want a more restricted query. So maybe you want all the genes on one chromosome. In most cases, you want something more specific. You want to make Biomark select genes, probe sets, or sets. <coughs> so maybe you want to export all probes that measure expression for selected genes, or you want all non-synonymous SNPs in, uh, in a gene. You want all autologs uh, for your selected genes, and so on. All protein into probe domains for all proteins. So Biomark can handle all these types of queries. Now, it's really, really easy to use. You just need to follow a few steps, which we're going to, uh, which I'm going to show you now. 
If you want to follow me, you go to page 36. Uh, in a minute. Now I'm just going to describe the principle and then with the example we're going to go to page 36. So first just the principle. So this is how biomark page looks like. And the first thing you need to do is to select what kind of um, data you want to look at. In most cases, you will use this ensemble sheet. The version here, this 59, is a version of ensemble. Now we're at 63. So this will differ based on when you use it. So in most cases, you will select ensemble sheets. We also have ensemble variation and ensemble regulation. So it depends from what kind of point you're starting. So in most cases, you will export something about genes. So we'll start with ensemble genes. This is just an example. We move on to the world to example. And then you need to select an organism. So again, really simple. In this case, it's homo sapiens. What you need to do next is you need to define filters. So here is something called filter. And filter is something you're narrowing the search bar. You're kind of limiting biomark. Because in most cases, you will not want all the genes. But you want biomark to narrow the search. So you can either search bar, narrow the search bar region, you want chromosome 22, or you want specific band of the chromosome, or you want list of specific genes, so then you would narrow the search bar genes. Transcript event, gene ontology I mentioned are those data coming from gene ontology, so that would be function, expression, multiple species comparison, protein domains, or variation. So, for example, you have a list of interpro domains. You want to search all the genes which have certain interpro domains. So you would go for this option. So select data set, organism, then filters, narrow the search by something. Once you're happy with this, you just select what you want. And what you want is called attributes. So attributes will attach some information. And again, you can attach information about, it's called features here, but basically you will attach information about genes. So maybe you want all the uh, microarray probes for a gene, so then you would help for some of these. You want all protein domains. Or you want structures, you want start and end position of transcript. Variations is obvious. Transcript event is export all transcripts which do not undergo, uh, export all genes which do not have alternative trans uh, alternative splicing. Homologs will export all orthologs or paralogs and sequences of this again. You can export all protein coding sequences or all upstream sequences. Maybe you want to search for similarity in transcription factors binding, so you would want to export upstream region for 100 genes. So, biomark very simple, three easy steps. The other op uh, export option, as I said, sequences, gene IDs, microarray data, or plots, names, variation. The results can be either tabular or sequences. And now we go to the real uh, example, which is on page 36. So, imagine that we from the genome-wide association catalogs, we put a list of 18 human genes which have been found to be associated with Alzheimer's disease or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. And maybe we want to test some of these genes in mouse models. So we want to, sorry, so we want to uh, find whether these 18 genes have mouse orthologs and we want to export the sequence so we can perform, we can prepare some uh, experiments. So I have 18 human genes, and I want to find out whether they have human, uh, whether they have mouse orthologs, and what is the sequence. So if I look at this, I have these 18 genes, and I want to do this. Which one of these is going to be my filters, and which is going to be attributed? 
So filter is something to narrow the search bar limit, the bar mark. Attribute is the information you want. So this thing, is this a filter or an attribute? So filter is something I want to narrow the search bar. So I have a list of 18 genes, so this is going to be my filter. Attributes, the information I want. So I want for this list to get mouse or plus. So this is going to be my attribute. So now how we do that. I go to Biomart and first I need to select um, select which kind of Biomart I'm going to use. So we're starting with the list of 18 genes. So I'm going to select Ensemble Genes. And next, this is a tricky one, if you haven't seen it yet. I have a list of 18 human genes, which are, and I want mouse ortholox. Will I use human or mouse to start with? So, because even though I want mouse ortholox, I am starting with human genes. So, the organism I'm going to select is human. So select ensemble genes and select human as an organism I want to search. Filters, as I said, is the list of 18 genes. So I am going to expand this gene option. And expand is just by clicking at the plus sign. So I open gene and when I click on the plus sign, I can see all sorts of options. And one of them is idealist limit. Ensemble is very good in converting IDs or associating IDs. So imagine someone gives you 20 ensemble identifiers for genes and you want to have a look whether they have any NCBI RefSeq identifier. So you would do exactly the same thing. You would select list of IDs, you would select ensemble IDs and you could export the RefSeq IDs. So ID is limit. And in this case, we didn't have ensemble gene IDs, but we have gene symbols. And I've said in the morning that gene symbols in human comes from HGNC. So I'm going to search for HGNC symbols. So I just select this plus model, this up and down arrows. And we'll look for something which was at HGNC symbols and paste, copy and paste the symbols here. To find out whether I've selected the right options, whether my gene symbols are recognized, I would click out here. And you can see that 18 that 18 genes out of all the 53,000 genes, more than 53,000 genes we have in ensemble have been recognized. So I'm happy with this. So that's just to check. And now I want to attach the attributes and I want it mouse ortholox. So mouse ortholox intuitively will be found under homolog. So again I select homolog and I select that I want ensemble gene ID and maybe for clear for clarity I also want associated gene name. So that would be the symbol. So I select this. And then expand ortholox option to search for mouse. So you just scroll down the page and select mouse ortholox again on some gene ID. And for example, mouse chromosome starting and whatever you like. So I've selected a few options here. And that's it. Once I'm happy with that, I can see my query here. So I've searched by HGNC gene symbols and wanted all these attributes. But I click result and all I get is this table. Here are the associated gene names, human ensemble IDs, the mouse, ones, chromosomes, and some information. By default, Primark only gives you first and rows. So if you want to see everything, you can again expand this up and down arrow. You can not only view it as an HTML site, view 
you're exporting large amounts of data, you may want to export data to files, and again, you can select different options, TSV or CSV for uh, Excel, but uh, you are the one. Important thing in Biomark is to select this unique results only, because Biomark are just really big tables which have different lines with different information, but sometimes you're exporting only the parts of the tables which don't have, where the differences are somewhere outside you can't see, so you can get duplicated lines. It's just for your information. Just basically select unique results only. If you don't, you may get lines which are duplicated. And that's it. So we've exported mass orthologs, and now you can follow the examples on the page. And um, you can use the IDs to download protein sequences and download the protein domain information. But before you do that, I just want to mention two more things. So Biomark started in Ensemble, but now has been moved and is hosted. It's a collaboration between EBR and Ontario Cancer Research Institute. And from Ensemble, Biomark traveled very far. And nowadays, you can, today, when you learn how to use Biomark, you can apply this knowledge to many, many different databases. Nowadays, all these different databases, which can be assessed via this biomark.org site, work on the exactly same principle. So you will select the database, select organism, or similar things. So all these other databases you can apply your biomark knowledge to. So then you can do, for example, more complex queries. You can also join different databases together. So here, in addition to exporting mouse, um, mouse genes, we also added data from this expression of last. By the joint query, we can get um, results from two databases in one. So that's further more advanced. Tomorrow, you will actually hear about, for example, um, Reactome. So you can easily join data. Maybe you found 18 genes from in a genome wide association study. You want to see the mouse orthologs, but you also want to see whether they're in the same pathway. So easily, you can join two projects together. Any questions about Biomark? Biomark is easier if you practice. It's just watching me probably doesn't make much sense. So you can start from the beginning. So on page 36, it starts from the list of the genes. And even though I showed you how to do it, you can kind of pretend that I have it, and you can try to find your way. And it also shows you how to export the sequences and how to finish the whole exercise. And after that, you have even more exercises and again answers this time with Biomark. So, comparative genomics, what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about the species. We're going to look at something called gene trees and homology prediction, protein families, whole genome alignment, and also how to be using tennis region already seen. Why would you be interested in comparative genomics? It can help us understand evolution. It will show you what the differences are between species at the genomic level. It's an important um, tool which will help us understand gene function based on the protein or transcript similarity. It will help us identify also region, important regions which are non coding but highly conserved and in some cases for the trouble gene predictions. So as I said, Ensemble focuses on vertebrate species, but for comparative genomics purposes, it also includes a group of these three odd species, which includes Drosophila, Sinoraptitis, and Saccharomyces. So these, all these species will be included in something you see in Ensemble, and it's called Ensemble. I've also mentioned that a sister project of Ensemble is Ensemble Genomes, which does not include vertebrates, but includes plants, bacteria, fungi, and protists. They have their comparative 
genomics uh, tools as well. And the tools which cover all these different taxons and also include ensemble vertebrates is called Pampampara. So if you go to ensemble genomes, you can see vertebrates in relation to other um, taxons as well. So it's only available at the moment at ensemble genomes. It's additional analysis. So in ensemble genomes, you will always see a comparative genomic analysis, which will be done on all the species within the taxon. But then there will be a summary one, which includes the selected organisms from each taxon. So if you're looking at genes which are highly concerned between all taxons, you may want to start in ensemble genomes and not in ensemble. Now, one of the first thing of the comparative genomics uh, team does is called uh, uh, gene trees. Gene trees are basically used to predict orthology and parology of genes. It's based on, even though it's called a gene tree, they're all based on protein alignment. And these are mainly important for finding uh, associations, for example, of human genes with model organism genes, Inferring evolutionary relationship between proteins, identifying uh, genes which are common between species and different between species, and also help us facilitate the annotation of novel genome. If you don't know anything about the new genome coming in, you can still predict position of new genes by looking at similar ones in closely related species. Now, just to refresh, I'm sure you all know, but not always we get people who know. So we have homolog relationships, and you already saw that the tables include ortholog and paralog. Uh, orthologs are genes which are a result of speciation. Paralogs are generally results of duplication. Would I find orthologs between species or in the same species? Orthologs are between species. Is everyone familiar? It's okay, orthologs and paralogs. I don't need to go into too much detail. So, just a summary, I'm sure you all know. So, orthologs result of speciations. They will be between species. So, for example, I will have BRCA2 gene and ortholog in human and mouse. But I also have BRCA1 and BRCA2. These are results of old gene duplication, they will be called paralog and they will all be in one species. What also is important that orthologs, the ones which are from between species, generally maintain the original function. That's why we can use them to infer gene function. Paralogs are results of gene duplication and during evolution, one of the genes generally acquired a novel function. So that's important. Now how the gene trees are created? What happens first, as I said, they are based on protein alignment. So what the pipeline does, it first takes all canonical proteins. Canonical generally is a protein which is the longest isoform, or sometimes the isoform which is supported by the CCDS record I mentioned before. So something uh, highly reliable. So we take all representative proteins for each gene and we cluster uh, them together using glass, match them uh, using glass, then they're uh, further clustered uh, into groups using this H cluster G. You don't really need to know, but what's important is all proteins against all proteins. These are later on uh, aligned using multiple sequence alignment. So First we find some similarity, then we try to align them. And once we have these alignments, we need to fit them into the phylogenetic tree. So we know the relationship between organisms. So from here to here, we just try to fit it in the tree. And once we have the tree, you can easily say which genes are orthologs and which genes are paralogs. So this is briefly how the ortology and paralogy tables are created. So these easy steps. Uh, the multiple sequence alignments and copy and the tree best programs, they're commonly used in comparative genomics, so this is not much something special. But um, compared to other browsers, ensemble 
gives you the opportunity to look at orthologs and paralogs. So in case you look at some different ones and you don't understand why the orthologs predicted by something else look different, this is just to keep in mind how, how it's been done in ensemble. And if you really want details, then everything's been published so you can look at the records. The step here, uh, fitting the multiple sequence alignment into the phylogenetic tree, is not always simple if if the results are very clear, we get um, this kind of looking like tree. In ensemble, the speciation node is always in blue, the duplication node is in red, so duplication leads to parallel speciation uh, node to orthologs. So if we have two clear orthologs, then we infer relationship orthologue one to one. Again, it's not important, it's just you can see it in the table. So you may want to know what it means. So one-to-one -one relationship just means that one human gene in this case has one mouse orthologs. In this case, you can see that one human gene has two mouse orthologs. The relationship between, uh, in this case, two human genes have two mouse orthologs. So the relationship is orthologue many to many. Uh, Within species, paralogs are clear, so again, this would be my BRCA1 and BRCA2, so that would be called within species paralogs. Uh, that's one of the most common types. You can also uh, obviously look at between species paralogs, but that would be, uh, that's very common thing. That would be basically all the remaining ones. So these are generally this type between species paralogs. You don't see in the tables, they're just not listed. So you would either see orthologs or paralogs uh, within species paralogs. The only thing is exception when ideally you would like a tree like this, where we have clear orthologs one to one. But sometimes the pipeline doesn't predict things correctly. So the tree here should look like this. There should be two speciation knots. But the pipeline somehow predicted here a duplication node. But we know that uh, this duplication node to be real here, we would need to lose two genes in this way and one gene in this way. So we don't really think this is real. So another type you will rarely see, but you may see, is called a parent orthologue one to one. We, even though here's a duplication, and these should be called parallels. We don't think it's real. So there's a next up there which is called the parent ortholog one to one. If it's too complicated, don't worry. Basically, all you want are orthologs and prologs. This is a special case and doesn't happen too often. Now, how does it look like? G trees can be found in the gene based view, uh, just above the ortholog and prolog section. They look like this. So you can see, again, the red nodes duplications, blue node speciations. On the left-hand side, you can see the tree. On the right-hand side here, you can see the individual protein alignment. The dark green means high conservation. White uh, spaces mean that there's very little homology in these regions. So two representations in one. You generally can see that exons uh, are quite the uh, by default, the trees in most cases would be very large. So by default, they're kind of clustered together. If you want to expand what's hidden in the tree, you can either use one of these view options or you can click on the tree itself. The gene you search from is, uh, is always represented in red. If there are any within species paralogs, you can find them in the gene tree that was there in blue. And as I said, you can collapse or expand the individual subtrees by clicking on the links here. So you can see that this tree is actually extension of this very, very large tree. If you click on the individual node, you get information about how many genes are there, what's the, um, uh, what's the highest taxon they have in common. You can expand or collapse the tree. You can also quickly export all the alignments straight away. You don't need to run those things through your own programs. Um, 
example, as a useful multiple sequence alignment editor called Jumpy. We've already looked at the orthologs, so at the top of the page you have the summary, and now it may make the, the kind of fields here may be making more sense. So we can see all the orthologs in this case probably for mouse. So we have the species. Now you know that one to one ortholog just means that one alpaca genes is orthologous to a probably mouse gene I started with or human gene. Linked to alpaca genome description, you can see the individual alignment. And it also tells you what is the similarity. Um, target and query similarity. And one can guess why these are different. Well, in this case, are similar, but here. What is target and what is query similarity? We all understand what similarity. I have two proteins and I calculate how many uh, amino acids or nucleotides are represented in both. So how come I get two numbers? It only depends which one I compare. If one is much longer, then it depends which way I divide them. So target similarity will be based on target, query similarity will be based on. So based on query. So it's just whether I'm using in this case alpaca as the as the first one or the human one as the first one. It will give me, in this case, the same one. Gene trees are not only available for protein coding genes, we also build uh, gene trees for non coding RNAs. In this case, you know that non coding RNAs not only uh, sequence is important, but you know that RNAs, because they're single stranded, they tend to, uh, they tend to form uh, complex further structures. So, in addition to the sequence, we also take into account the secondary structure information. So it all starts, the clustering starts from our fan database, which is one of the biggest databases for non-coding RNAs. So they do the clustering for us. All we do is the multiple sequence alignment and infer, also check for the important secondary structure properties. And the tree looks very similar here. In this case, it's obviously not protein, but RNA. similar protein domains to kind of 
this view, you can also do a special thing to region in detail. You can attach two, you can put two regions in detail in one view, or even more. So in this case, we're looking at a region in view in human.
composition of constraint elements. And an ensemble constraint element is just a region with high conservation scores. Now, how does it look like? So we saw that in the morning. These are these calculated conservation scores. So if there's a region of high conservation, generally, again, the line in the position of exons, the score is very high. Regions which um, the line here goes below, these regions are just less likely to conserve. Regions where there's the long stretches of conservation are then represented by this block, which we call constraint element. There's uh, one thing to note about low coverage genomes. So now there's loads of genomes are being sequenced, but sequencing genomes with high accuracy is very expensive. So a lot of genomes are produced. Uh, which are not as good. We call them low coverage genomes. Uh, do you know next generation sequencing? Does everyone know what I mean by low coverage genome? So human sequence would be high coverage genome. The, each part of the sequence has been resequenced several times. Low coverage genomes sometimes are only, for example, two, twice, uh, two cover, like twice Covered. So this means that individual, on average, the sequence only is covered by two reads. So not very good. Hard to create genomes from these, and they may a lot of contain a lot of they may contain a lot of errors. So they may kind of cause problems in the multiple sequence alignment. So this is just here that um, even though here I say that I've created my multiple sequence, uh, multiple species, whole alignments using 34 vertebrates. Actually, a lot of them don't have a good quality. So what happened is that we first uh, used the EPO pipeline to create uh, what I showed you before using the high coverage genomes. And then the low coverage genomes are just added on one to one basis. So even though it's this EPO, the low coverage genomes are added on one to one basis it will be too hard for the program to process the not so good genomes. And the last thing were synthetic regions. So uh, these come from the whole genome alignments and basically what we look for are regions with uh, similarity or First, we look for shorter regions, which are uh, closer than 200 kilobase pairs. So first, we group shorter, shorter regions, which uh, align. And then in the second phase, uh, we link them if, uh, if there are no big gaps between them, so less than three megabase pairs apart. Basically, all we do is look at the alignments, look for regions which are really similar, and if they're close together, we merge them together and produce larger synthetic region. Synthetic region, again, is just a region which, in which the two species have the same genes and the genes are in the same orientation. These regions can be very large, and this is how it looks like. So for this is a synthetic view, you can see in the again from the region in detail. So in the middle here we have a human chromosome and I've selected here that I want to see what synthetic region corresponds in mouse. So I selected mouse and here you can see that several mouse chromosomes uh, have synthetic regions. And then the links between the regions are represented by these lines here. You can also, if you select one of them, you can also see what kind of genes are there, and you can switch between the ones in human and mouse So the last but not least talk is about variation. I'm going to talk about what types of variation we can talk about. The phenotype data you can find in ensemble, the population data. 
So don't worry if you see a sequence and there will be an R red sum. That just means that it refers to one of the codes in the YPSC. <coughs> if you don't know this, you can go to Ensemble and in, uh, on the help page. If you click, I think, on the help, it will open. So deletion and initializations are more complex.
non synonymous that means that the SNP affects uh, the resulting amino acid. You know that the nucleotide code is degenerated. So some triplets can code for the same amino acid. In some cases, it will change. So if it changes amino acid, it's called non-synonymous. If the SNP does not result in different amino acid, it's referred to as synonymous. Deletions or insertions are likely to cause frame shift. So it means it changes the reading frame. Probably, again, uh, it's going to disrupt the protein function changes the protein sequence, most likely it will lead to premature termination codon or different changes. Function can also be variants which affect splice They may lead to retaining some of the uh, introns, extending or skipping some of the exons. So potentially variants in the splice are functional. And the last group are variants which are in the red lottery region. So for example, if you find variants in promoter, they may lead to change in the transcription factor binding site. And in this case, the most likely effect would be differences in the level of the expression of the gene. So the transcription factors doesn't bind, it may, be low, may lead to lower expression or yeah, creation of a new transcription factor binding site over expression. The, just a kind of broad summary of what the consequences are. In Ensemble, we actually have many more. So the first one was just to give you a brief explanation, but you will actually find all these different ones. So if you have any questions about them, then you can ask me later. But basically, they covered the main ones. So in addition to this kind of vague uh, functional consequence, you may want to know more whether you, you found the variant, you sequence the patient, you found the variant in the gene, in the coding sequence, and you really want to know how likely it is that this variant has an effect on the protein. So there are two al there are more algorithms. In Ensemble, we use two different algorithms, SIF and Polyphen, which in it look at conservation and physicochemical properties of the change. And they can tell you how likely the non-synonymous change is to affect the protein sequence. So the scores are something like deleterious, probably damaging to benign ones or tolerated. So it can add further support for the functional consequence of the variant you're looking at. So at the very end of the table, it's only for non-synonymous variants. You will also get these two columns sick. So that was about variants in general. Now, there's been a lot of effort to map variants between populations and see uh, how that differs. Um, so one of the first projects which looked at this is a project called HubMap. You might have already seen that. So they tried to uh, look at uh, genotypic differences between population and use these to create linkage to equilibrium, calculate linkage to equilibrium in regions. And why this is important is before the next generation sequencing, uh, people used to use genotyping SNPs and uh, genotyping SNP arrays. And uh, it was expensive, or even if you do a gene sequencing, it's expensive to genotype all the possible variants. So by calculating how individual variants are linked together, you could use, if they're very linked, you could use only one instead of typing all the ones which are in, with the same frequency, which are kind of linked together. So that's what HubMap was about. So they, in addition to kind of mapping the genetic diversity, they uh, help to describe the statistics in regions and identify common haplotypes and from there something we call tagging SNP. So tagging SNP is something which if you genotype this one you also get information about the ones which are linked to this uh, tagging SNP. So, 
is to all the youth, and for that I also have this table here. So it had not more than 270 individuals for statements, and you very often see these kind of abbreviations. So in Europe, we must commonly use uh, look at the CEU population because that reflects uh, Europeans. In Japan, you have a cohort with abbreviation JPT. So if you're looking on something and you want to see what's the frequency of this variant in Japanese population, you know that you should look here. If you want to compare it, for example, to Chinese, then you would search for CHP. So these are just very long terms, so there are kind of abbreviations standardly used in different databases. Another project which uh, main aim of this project was to map all the variants with frequency at least 1%. Passing genome started with next generation sequencing. So the approach is slightly different. They could do the whole genome and uh, with the sequencing costs coming down, even more individuals. So nowadays, 1,000 genomes change into 2,000 genomes, so the end is not anymore 1,000 genomes, but it's 2,000 individuals from 20 populations and at least four times coverage. So it had three stages. The first one was uh, just basically when the next generation sequencing was starting, so it's a low coverage of 108 samples. This was followed up by uh, sequencing trios at very high coverage and kind of calculating how well these compare and how what coverage is needed to cover most of the variation variability. And at the third stage, whole genome sequencing is still quite expensive. And we know in humans that we're mostly interested in variants which affect coding regions because they're likely to have effect. So at the third stage here, uh, selected regions, mostly protein coding, uh, are sequenced at 50 times coverage. The site is here, and 1000 Genomes Browser is one of the ones powered by ensemble, so you can use it in exactly the same way as the ensemble genome browser. With next generation sequencing, the price of next generation sequencing coming down. Not only big projects like Thousand Genomes can afford sequence individuals. I mean, there are a lot of other organisms, I'm just talking about human here, but of course you can sequence anything you like. But in humans, the first uh, genomes resequenced were Watson and Winters. So you can go to Ensemble and search for any variants they have. So these two genomes are publicly available. These were further followed by a few Asian and African genomes. And more and more often, uh, even patient samples are being sequenced and other small projects are rapidly uh, being created. So what Ensemble can help you with, we can't sequence the data for you, but uh, we can allow you to see most of the publicly available ones. And we can also allow you to upload your own data and visualize them in Ensemble. So this is one of the short sequencing reads visible in Ensemble. So here you can see the, the tracks and here kind of the coverage and uh, the most abundant nucleotide. Here in this case, variants are labeled in red, but it depends how you want your data. This is just an informatic track from Tulsa Genomes. So that's how that's one one thing you can you can do with Ensemble. The publicly available genomes I tried to show you in the morning are available in the location under resequencing. So in case of humans, we have the alignments of James Watson and Craig Winter. Nowadays we also have some of the Tulsa Genomes data. For mouse, we have several strains. For Drosophila, you can look at different strains, and so on. Here, the identified variants are displayed. And this is an example of the individual mouse strains. You can also uh, visualize linkage to sequence. So, when sample recalculates the correlation 
these three views we covered in the morning. What I haven't really showed you is how the SNPs and structural variants look in region and detail. So structural variants are very large. So in this case, uh, this is the sequence. And here we have a very long structural variant. So they're black and blue. If you want to find out where, who deposited them and what publication they relate to, you just click on the track. The single nucleotide variants are short, so in ensemble they're just represented as these lines. They're color-coded, <coughs> and the legend is, uh, is here at the bottom. So blue are generally intronate, uh, this orange will be splice side, green non -synonymous, uh, sorry, synonymous, but you don't need to know, so uh, all the description is below. And again, if you click on the individual variants, you get a brief description. This is more for clinical geneticists because they look at all sorts of different data. So one can also attach additional databases like position of reads from exome sequencing and some other structural databases. So this is just use of a uh, distributed annotated system. So this does not only apply to variant data, you can attach anything which is available in the dust registry to ensemble. And then dust registry is just a big place where lots of people share their data. If you want to know more about variant, we haven't looked at this, but every variant has its own view. So here we can see that we're in variation. And the view contains all sorts of data. I've showed you the flanking sequence. You can look at the positioning of the variant with the gene and transcript. You can look for the gene frequency, individual genotypes, linkage to sick group room, phenotype data, but also pre-calculated phylogenetic context. So maybe you want to see whether this SNP is conserved between primates or vertebrates. So you quickly, you don't need to go all the way back to comparative genomics, you can just use this data. Phenotype data get very useful. So we collect data from several databases, which look, well, which look at SNPs and their association with phenotypes. So every variant where some relation to disease was reported into one of these databases will be also available in ensemble. So generally, the phenotype data would include the disease, which study it comes from, and which source, and which study. If it's a genome-wide association study, we also, if available, we also tell you which one of the alleles is associated and what was the p-value obtained. This again is more for clinicians. I'm probably even going to skip this, but uh, not every clinical lab uses kind of consensus sequences. Sometimes the gene has been sequenced for 50 years, and it's always been the mutations and the position of the variants has been reported against one particular transcript, which is not necessarily one we have in ensemble or not necessarily the one most abundant or something. So for that there's a special database which is called Locus Reference Genomic and it's where clinicians deposit the sequence they want to report variants against. And then it also tells you what's the identifier in RefSeq seq for this and what's the ensemble identifier. So you do not need to kind of compare the sequences yourself. So it allows you The last thing uh, people use, not only for human, is our tool which is called Variant Effect Predictor. And probably it is most useful if you work with human sequence or you work with some uh, mouse traits. So what happens if you identify a new variant and you want to know what is the functional consequence? Does it overlap with exons? Does it overlap with any regulatory regions? What is the 
is the set or polyphon score. So imagine you would want to do that yourself for 20 variants. You would have to tap the position of the variant, have a look in ensemble where it's located, probably go to set or polyphon to do the calculations. So what that variant effect predictor allows you to do is just to paste the position of the variant. So chromosome start and end of the variant, the two different alleles, and press next. And what you get is a table with all the results. So it will, if you will do all the comparison, it will tell you which transcripts it overlaps with, whether it's non with non synonymous and what the polyphon answer is.
produced by a regulatory bill that uh, works in two stages. So first we take the available experiment and look for regions where uh, the scientists found that there's DNA swan uh, accessibility side. And also where uh, transcription factors are binding. So loads of labs use different transcription factors and look for the binding sites in the region. So we take the data which are available, align these to the genome, so basically map the position of these. That's the first part, and then these are extended in a cell type specific manner. So in addition to these kind of narrow, very exact binding sites, we extend these based on cell type and also add histone modifications such as methylation and acetylation, which different combinations are more of a support of promoter sites or inactive uh, transcription start sites. So this is just a representation of the same thing. So we have several different experiments. So in this case, we have three experiments in one cell line. So we have DNAs one results, results from transcription factor CTCF binding, and results from TAF1 transcription factor binding. We map these into these regions in the genome. Similar <coughs> for this other cell type, they map in the same genome. So we create also an overview, which is called a multi-cell regulatory feature. That's just a summary of all what's been found in the different cell lines. And to this, we add the different hospital modifications and extend this kind of narrow core region, you can see here, by the support from histone modifications. Do the same for another cell types. And this is something you will see then in the browser. These are just a, this is just a list of the cell lines so far because they did ensemble. There are many more available, and UCSC also has more. So here is how it really looks like. So again, we're in the region in health. This is the regulatory feature, which is the kind of multiple one. It's the summary of everything. You can opt to just look at certain cell lines. So in this case, I'm just looking at this human umbilical cell. So I can see that here, the region is predicted to be slightly longer. And then you can also aim to, we can also opt to kind of see exactly what support is for this regulatory feature. So if you go to configure this page, you can select uh, individual uh, experiments. So in this case, you can see that it's supported by DNA squad experiments that defines the core, and it's extended based on histone 3 uh, lysine 4 method trimethylation and polymerase 3 binding site. These experiments are still uh, kind of in the start. So Ensemble tries to give you the, same, the best guess we can at the moment. It's not final. So if you know you've been working with something, you've been long time testing your cell line and, uh, for a specific regulatory region and you can't find it in Ensemble, it doesn't mean it's not there. It's just none of the experiments as yet supported it. So if you found the transcription factor binding site, but none of the experiments done so far actually looked at the transcription factor binding site, doesn't mean that your data are not real. So somehow limited, but this uh, ENCODE project is really expanding and soon is going to cover it. As I said, some of the data are based on transcription factors binding sites. So here you can see that some of the links here have this uh, black line here. And that just means that uh, transcription factor has been found to bound it bind into this site. So if you click on this, you get a similar table to this. And if you know something about transcription factors, you know that they are a little bit promiscuous, but in a way they tend to bind to a region with kind of similar sequence. So by clicking on that link, you can get something we call position weight matrix. 
which just shows you the most likely sequence the individual transcription factor binds to. These are taken from Jasper. So it's just again means that you don't need to have a look here and then go again to a different database. So again, directly you can assess all this information through an assembly. And in addition to all this data from ENCODE, which we used to, to annotate red library features, we also import data from other databases, such as SysRed, which uh, talks about red library motifs. MicroRNAs are imported from Miranda. Vista is a very good database which looks at enhancers, and it's most uh, and it's experimentally supported. So that's why I have it here. So if a red library region is supported by Vista, you're most likely to be able to have a look at all the functional experiments here. More and more methylation data are coming from, and also expression quantitative trait, those are mostly from the same range that you are available. So all this you can attach to the bridge in detail. And yes, the roadshow is not black bear, but yes, if you forget anything just for a third time, I'll mention it. Helping documentation, or if you want to email any questions.